Good afternoon. Um, it's such a joy to be here. I was just saying um, that the last time I was in East Madeir Park was about 10 years ago for the Big Chill. And it's so lovely to come back and be at EMF, which is one of the festivals I've always wanted to be. Um, but yeah, um, my name is Chris Bartholomew. I am predominantly a electronic musician, composer, and technologist. Um, this whole project started with a chance meeting in a theatre bar in Adelaide um, in 2022. A good friend of mine was over there um, performing at the Adelaide Fringe, and I do a load of uh, tech work on, on his show, and, but didn't get the opportunity to go to Australia. It's a great shame. Um, he met an Australian biology student in this bar, and they got talking about the idea of sonifying DNA sequences and using those to create a piece of music. And what if you could make a personal piece of music from a DNA sequence? Now, you might be slightly confused on the basis that I'm here under a slide saying making music with hair, not making music with DNA. At about the same time, I was reading um, how to Argue with Racists by Adam Brotherford. Highly recommend. Fantastic book about uh, genetics and the bad science that is used by prejudiced people to make their arguments. And when I eventually met Jay Wellens, um, the, the other person who is unfortunately not able to come over from Australia for this, uh, we had a conversation. I was like, I really like the idea of making music out of someone's individual biology and, and doing that, but I'm a little bit nervous about doing it with DNA. A couple of reasons for that. A, as per Rutherford, um, the genetic, uh, genetics and DNA is still a subject that the science is developing massively about, and the um, relationship between DNA and our physical attributes is still quite contested. Um, in terms of their relationship. So it's a sort of shaky basis to start a big project on. Also, don't want to attract people with views that I find really unpleasant. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is that DNA, when I think about DNA, I don't think about a physical thing. I think about that textbook image of the little circles uh, with lines through drawn to map out the, the helix. I don't think about a person. I don't think about the person who that DNA is a part of. So we decided to zoom out a little bit, and I suggested hair, A, because it's got such an enormous cultural uh, significance, such a huge personal significance, but also the science of it is, especially for me who only graduated, uh, who only did GCSE science, is much more uh, tangible and easy for me to understand and explain. This is where I put the caveat of the talk in, is that I'm largely the music side of the project, Jay's the science part, so if I do get any of the science wrong, please forgive me, um, they are the expert. So, with that, I will launch into the science bit of this talk. We'll get this done, I'll get over my slight fear of it, and then we'll crack on. So, what is hair? It's the thing that grows out of your head, Chris. Yes, I know that. But uh, when we deconstruct it, we start with these tiny little collections of molecules called amino acids. Those form into uh, strings of ke called keratins, and those are proteins, and they uh, can be arranged in different ways. And the arrangement of those keratins shapes how the hair forms. So in some arrangements, they'll turn into the kind of hair that I have on my head. In other arrangements, they'll turn into fingernails or even a rhino's horn. Um, though each, the hair is then made up of lots of different parts, and each of those parts is defined by the different uh, keratins that it creates, uh, that it contains. Um, so the, um, here we can see uh, like a slice diagram and we can see all the different sections of the hair. Uh, so, um, oh, this doesn't have my favorite one, which is the Huxley layer. But in the matrix, we can see that we've got one type one keratin, K35, and one type two keratin, K37, uh, K85. Um, now, some of those keratins are shared across different groups, um, and there is uh, about two, 
I've forgotten the number. That's really embarrassing. Uh, around 30 different keratins that go into make up human hair. Who here? That's largely the science of hair. You start with these tiny little amino acids, you string them together into keratins, the keratins you arrange into groups that form different parts of the hair. So, how do we turn that into something that you might want to listen to? Um, there is, if you have ever seen on, and they're usually on Facebook, and they are from the tabloid science websites, and they will say something like, listen to the sound of the sun. That is an example of a technique called data sonification. And essentially, you're taking one set of data or uh, one set of physical uh, characteristics and mapping those onto the characteristics of sound. We generally think of the characteristics of sound as uh, pitch, time, amplitude, volume, um, I'm sure there's more. Anyway, we'll deal with those three for the time being. Well, the issue with that is that in that gap between the sun and the sound that you're hearing, there is an interpretive layer um, whereby you have to choose which uh, of those physical at attributes are going to match onto the different parts of the sound. Um, and yes, no surprises here in science communication and journalism that tends to get slightly ignored. Um, we're going to kind of reveal that process today and bask in it, and the only reason to do that is so that you know that this is one way that you could make music out of hair. If you come back here at 3 p.m. for a talk by uh, Bristopher Cartholomew, you might hear a totally different way of implementing that interpretive layer to go from physical property to sound output. Um, with that in mind, this is how we've done it. So, um, the good way of thinking about this is like uh, an engine and a driver. Um, so, our engine is going to be based on the science behind hair, which is largely objective. Uh, it's pretty universal. Um, you know, wh however those keratins are arranged, we largely all have the same keratins and they're all made up of the same amino acids. Um, they don't really change. Um, and so the engine that makes up this system, we need to make sure that it, the, map, the interpretive layer leads to a consistent result between the physical inputs and the sonic. Then to actually make an interesting piece of music, we need to give this system some structure. We need to give it some direction. You know, a car just sat in the driveway with the engine running isn't doing anyone any good. We need it to take us to the shops. Um, that is the kind of the subjective bit of this. This is the personal where we use somebody's particular hair, their relationship with their hair, the relationship that they have with their culture and how their culture views their hair to create the structure of the piece. So, here is the, how that engine works. We start with the amino acids. There's 20 amino acids that go into making up a hair. And essentially, for each amino acid, we're going to assign one of those a different pitch. Now, those pitches are going to be played by the keratins. And those are all different instruments. And then those keratins are going to come together in ensembles, little groups of, of players uh, that are going to represent parts of the hair. Everyone roughly with me so far? Great, superb. Um, we'll start. We'll start at the kind of the small end with the amino acids. It's quite a difficult thing to assign these pitches, uh, these amino acids to pitches. If we did it chromatically, so if we divided our octave by twelve, as we do in most Western music, and put a different uh, amino acid on each one, the piece of music we'd end up with would be. I think unlistenably bad. Um, it wouldn't have any kind of harmonic structure, it would just be fairly cacophonous. Um, if we did it with a, a diatonic scale, so that would be something like a major scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, um, the diatonic scale 
divides the octave by eight. And so how do we get, how do we map our 20 amino acids into eight pitches? That doesn't really work. We'd have to start doing stuff over different octaves. That throws up more problems later on. So instead, the first thing we want to do is ideally reduce that number of amino acids. So we want to look at a physical property of those amino acids that we can use to simplify that set down into a more manageable number. And we're going to do that with, uh, through a classification called hydropathy. This is definitely one of the science bits that I'm not going to explain. Uh, that halves a number of pitches. And across a diatonic scale, that means that we are limiting our pitch range down to two octaves. We can either do two pentatonic scales, or we can do a more weighted approach where we might highlight, let's say we're in C major, we'd use Cs multiple times, we'd use Gs multiple times, and Es a few times as well, so that we are really highlighting the harmony that we're trying to um, get the listener to engage with. Uh, one second, sorry, I just need to cough. Um, <coughs> thank you, sorry about that. Um, lovely. Um, similarly, with our keratins, we're going to try and uh, reduce, uh, trying to um, group these according to their physical properties. Um, there's 36 keratins present in human hair for anyone listening earlier who thought that I forgot that. That's the number. Um, and essentially, we want each of those keratins to be a different instrument, but to have some relationships in between them. Um, so to do that, we look at this. I spent so long looking at this diagram, and I don't know what it means. But it is a way of uh, grouping similar keratins. Um, not all of these are present in hair, um, but the first thing we can do is split them. So type two keratins, we're gonna give sustained longer sounds. Type one, we're gonna give shorter staccato sounds. So that's the difference between a violin bowing and a violin being plucked or played pizzicato. We're then going to look and uh, we're then going to separate them by register. So uh, K34, which is kind of up the top in um, type one. We're gonna make sure that's an instrument that can play the really high pitches. And K82, we're gonna make sure that's something like a double bass that can really ring out those, those low frequencies. We're then gonna split them into acoustic instruments and carp plus strong synths. Um, now, quick sojourn into carp plus strong. Is it's a, carp plus strong is an algorithm that uh, is designed to physically model digitally the sound of string instruments and it essentially works by um, if you've ever been in a like a brick archway and you give a clap and you then get those like flutter echoes and sometimes they get so close to each other that they begin to imply a pitch essentially that's what carpus strong synthesis does you give it a what's called an exciter um, so essentially the clap and it then runs that through a bunch of different delay lines very tightly together, which give it a pitch. There's lots of maths, there's lots of feedback involved, but the idea is to create a digital representation of, of physical strings. All of our purple keratins, we're going to use uh, on, uh, to be played by uh, other, um, other stringed instruments, um, and for that, I've tried to, as well as uh, separating them by register, try to do a really great mix of uh, Western and non-Western instruments. So we've got all your, your standard orchestral strings, but we've also got uh, Chinese Yanquin, uh, African Kora, um, and a lot of different string sounds from around the world. Okay, so that's how the engine works. How do we give it some structure? Well, at the moment, the way we do that is by taking a piece of hair, taking a photo of it, and then doing some analysis on that photo of the piece of hair that then creates our structure. 
So the first thing we do is create a harmonic map and we would start from the top left square. Um, uh, there we go. If we start in C major, every time we go a square to the... Uh, this is wrong on here. It should be every time we go to the right, we go to the dominant. Um, every time we go to the right, we go to the dominant. So we'd go from C major to G major. And then every time we go down, we go to the relative minor, the sixth. Um, so there we're going from uh, uh, G major to E minor, then to another dominant, B minor. It all works. Um, this uh, is something that I'm looking to refine a bit more. Um, this is a very, like, an interesting way of moving between kind of harmonic spaces and different tone centers, but you end up somewhere completely different than you started, which isn't always the most uh, satisfying structure for the listener. So I'm looking to kind of work on this at the moment. The next thing we use to control our engine to give it some direction is we measure the curliness of this piece of hair. Now, this is one of my pieces of hair, and you can tell it's not particularly curly, but how do we tell the computer that? Well, we start by drawing a line from its beginning to its end, and then measuring the distance on every point of the hair to that line. The further away it is from that line, the curlier the hair is. Apologies, Dave, I'm gonna cough one more time. Thank you very much. Um, this is then mapped to a cunning bit of devilry, which um, controls both the uh, rhythmic variation that goes on in the piece and also the register. So the higher the level of curliness, the more rhythmic variety there is and also the greater number of registers that are in play. Um, other things that we haven't involved in this yet that I'd really like, we can definitely start adding to this are things like uh, color, which we could use to define the starting key, um, the length of a piece of hair, which, yeah, we could use that to define the length of the piece of music quite comfortably, um, thickness, uh, growth rate, moisture of people's hair, these are all things which are quite easy to analyze. The main challenge at the moment is that getting the piece of hair into the computer is a manual process. So if I, there are any computer vision experts in the room, I would love to talk to you after this about maybe collaborating on how we make that work a little better. Um, brilliant. So I think let's do the next risky bit of the talk, which is to do the live demonstration. Um, and we will make a piece of music out of some hair. Now, this is the bit where if anyone would like to donate a piece of hair, this is your time to do so. I do have plenty. Is that our camera off at the back? Amazing. Oh, you are my favorite person. I will come up and grab a piece of your hair. Uh, whichever one you're happy to use. Amazing. Sorry, what was your name? I'm Ada. Ada. <laughs> Amazing. Lovely stuff. All right. Um, wonderful. So, first thing we're going to do is put that piece of hair on a... Oh, no. <laughs> I should have taken a picture while I was up there, shouldn't I? Let's try that one again. Ada, I'm coming back to you. Hey, what do you need? Sorry, one more. And I'll take the picture here so I don't lose it on the walk back. <laughs> That's the first lesson of this talk. Okay. You can pick one around if you want. Uh, let's go with that one. One, two, three, pull. I did get a couple there. Let's go with... That one is really nice. Wonderful, I've taken the photo. Thank you for a uh, big hand for Ada.
lovely. So, now we have that image, we can send that to the computer. Wonderful. And here we are. There is the piece of Ada's hair. Um, let's rotate that and get that the right way up. And then we're going to drag it into our first piece of software. This is a little hair tracing program that I've written in. Uh, this is Max MSP uh, hosted inside Ableton Live. Um, Max MSP is a node based uh, programming language used for lots of multimedia, but mainly, uh, mainly music. Now, our first job is to find the start of the hair, which I think is kind of there ish. Hit our record button, and then we'll start tracing it through. This is the bit of the process that, if I could automate, would be fantastic, mainly because it's quite hard to do this while carrying on talking. Um, any other 90s kids here remember uh, SMTV with Ant and Deck? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, they used to have like a, a wire trace game called Risk It for a Biscuit. And <laughs> that is exactly what I feel like. I'm, I'm going to go off the edge and it's going to have a buzzer and then the two Geordies are going to shout at me. Um, now that I live in Newcastle, that's more of a daily occurrence. Um, <laughs> Here we go. I joke, it's one of the most friendly places I've ever been. Um, lovely. We've recorded in the, that sound of our hair. We're now going to start analysing it to get the XY coordinates. And we are going to save that as a uh, CSV Ada uh, one. Super. We can hide that. And then... As if by magic, give that a minute to open up. There we go. That is all of the data points that we just got from Ada's hair. So we start with the index, then the X coordinate, then the Y coordinate, and then the curliness rating um, in pixels. So theoretically, that should start and end at the, uh, as close to one as it's possible to be. Um, considering it's a manual process. There we go. Um, so, if we try and listen to all 36 keratins at the same time, it sounds pretty chaotic, but that is exactly what we're going to do. Um, Dave, I'm going to fade this in gently at my end. That's as much more than I've got if I get a little bit more. Okay, at the moment, I hope you're all feeling unimpressed. Because certainly when I first did this, I was like, I've put six months into this and I'm getting nonsense out of it. Um, the key to this is zooming in on a particular part of the hair. So in these channels, we've got uh, all the different parts of the hair. So we can filter down our 36 into these little kind of chamber ensembles. Um, so let's start with cuticle one and see what cuticle one gives us.
Thank you very much. So um, I'll just wrap up with um, what we'd quite like to do in the future. Um, we are at a stage of sort of looking for some funding for this. Um, we think it could fit in really well in science communication context, obviously with someone more qualified doing the science communicating. Um, one of the things that could be possible is to have rooms or exhibits for each part of the hair with a multi-channel sound so you can walk between the different sounds of the hair. Um, I'd also love to make a hair music box that could come to festivals like electromagnetic fields. People come, put a piece of their own hair in, we tell them about the science, we create their piece of, uh, piece of music for them, and they've learned something and we've generated some music over the weekend, which would be awesome. I personally would love to do a concert of different people's hair. Um, I think that would be amazing. Um, and definitely that's something which would be awesome to do. Um, I'm going to wrap this up here because I think that's pretty much time. Um, and say a big thank you to EMF for having me here. Um, I'm going to be wandering around site for the next a uh, few hours recording lots of different things in lots of different ways. So if you see me and my bright blue t-shirt, come and flag me down. And um, anyone who's got any questions, I will be over at the Q&A uh, for about the next half an hour. But thank you all very much.